You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Well, hello. Sorry about that. Uh, I had a little technical difficulty that I had to work out. How's everybody doing tonight? So, uh, yeah, I'm trying going to be trying to do a quick live stream every Monday night just to kind of recap the show, what has been going on, fishing questions. I, I get so many comments on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Jake's Bait and Tackles, Facebook and Instagram, all of my stuff, too. And instead of trying to answer them as I go, it's better to collect them all try to get them together, answer them all in one shot, maybe create a little content for you guys, and then have on some special guests to kind of help some of these questions as well. So again, just to let you guys know for next week, if you have any questions, answer, ask them anywhere, and then I'll ask, I'll answer them on the Monday show. Sorry, still dealing with heat stroke from the Chesapeake Bay, which was an absolute just, it was a fun sauce. Uh, I also am going to be going over some data. Uh, I had a really cool conversation with the president of the bass club that I was in yesterday. Uh, and it was about just the kind of the winning weights on the Potomac and the Chesapeake. And so with my ADHD brain, I took all the data from the last six years and I put that on an Excel spreadsheet showing all the weights. And it's pretty interesting how good the Potomac is when it just from pure fish catch. It's almost like Lake Champlain where you're going to catch it. If you're half decent, you're going to catch five fish between 12 to 13 pounds easily the chesapeake you catch two that's a big deal now there's going to be one guy that's going to catch 50 pounds but then it just drops off a freaking cliff and we're going to go over that in a little bit but this other guy i know he's a super busy man so he's going to help me break down just kind of like how his season's been going and then also about this past weekend on the chesapeake bay so uh he's a legend in his own right the man the myth the legend uh chris how are you doing sir what's up dude a little dehydrated a little sunburned it wasn't fun. <laughs> yeah, that was that was miserable. That was the longest eight hours of fishing I've had in years. Talk to me about. I mean, I don't even know. Where, I want to do the Chesapeake, but I also want to talk about your season because right now you're you're doing really well in the points for uh, for the club we're in. So I guess for the people that haven't listened, and it's a shame if you haven't listened to this guy. He's been on the show a couple of times. Go back and listen to that. But for the people that are just tuning in now. What club are you a part of, and how did you get to be a part of them? So, me and Tom are both in Antietam Bassmasters. He spoke about it on the last uh, live stream. So, I'm going to get down the rabbit hole of the history and everything. If you want to know about it, go back and watch the other one. Um, but we just kind of asked, really. Uh, we were talking to Kenny, the tournament director, uh, me and Kurt, actually. You know, we were interested in joining a club just because we wanted some more tournaments to fish. And you know, another avenue to maybe make the Mr. Bass team if, if we did well. And they had some spots, so they voted us in, and here we are. And right now, you are sitting in third place, based on my notes, with 503 points, which is, but, you're, you're right within striking distance, dude. I'm one point behind Kurt. I'm one point out of second, and I'm 17 points out of first, so. We've had Lake Anna. Yep. Raystown. Yep. The Patamock, and then we had the Chesapeake. Like, I, I real quickly, um, just talk to me about your season so far. You start off like you know, for a two day, right? Yeah, and blew it completely. Blew it. What does that mean? Uh, lost three fish that I guarantee were anywhere between four and six pounds. So, ended up breaking one off, uh, lost one, and then lost another one. So, now um, that would have been no doubt about it. Yeah, because it only took what 14, 15 pounds to win down there. Mm -hmm. That would have probably put me close to 20, 21, somewhere around there. So, kind of shot myself in the foot on that. Uh, then we went to Race Town, and that was as equally miserable as yesterday. Just because of that wicked cold front that moved in. Uh, and then we go to the Potomac, and it's been like a three week straight beat down of fish down there. I mean, it has not been a shortage. Three Fridays ago, maybe it's been four Fridays ago now, uh, we caught 50 in a day between two of us. Yeah, and then go back the following weekend for the two tournaments. Have a really good day in the Potomac teams on Saturday. Uh, potentially had enough weight to maybe cash a check or at least break the top 15, but had some boat troubles. Uh, didn't feel comfortable leaving the size of fish I had in the live well with it not operating. 
So we tossed them back. Uh, we probably had 15 or 16 pounds, and I think 10th place was 16 pounds. So we were right there. Uh, and then we go back the next day for the club tournament, and within the first 15 minutes, I had a lemon. I mean, it was like that both days. So it fished better the last three weeks than I've ever seen it. it, it it's been insane. And then, guys, like, so – at Raystown, I think he got a fourth place, so he he was doing really well in the points, just grinding through it. And I, and I think honestly, that's what makes really good anglers, not just the guys that just tie on a big deal, the guys, and they either they catch twenty pounds or they just bomb. To be able to grind out, you're good enough, you're good enough each time, and all of a sudden you're in contention for for angler at your point. And it's weird because when you talk about your season, you're like, it's not like the best, but it doesn't suck. And I think that's the key: is it doesn't suck. And if you that's do that, the biggest thing. You just, I mean, even if you do have a tournament to where it does suck, like you, you can't let that get in your head. As long as you fight back, I mean, like last year, I think I ended up finishing third or fourth in points, but I missed two tournaments. So I made the most mm -hmm. of what I had, which, I mean, it killed me because like the ones that I missed, I potentially probably would have done well. Um, but it's, it's just like anything else. I mean, you can't get down in the dumps. You got to, you got to keep grinding. Um, claw your way back. It's not as hard to be consistent as, as people think. I, I, I really believe that. Um, I don't know. I think, like yesterday, making the right calls at the right time, um, just having that, like, inkling in the back of your mind. Like, for instance, I had four fish all the way up until, like, the last hour and a half could not get a fifth bite no matter how hard i tried i could not get a fifth bite and the guy i was with was throwing that uh the gooseberry zoom trick worm the the like black and june bug color trick worm yeah black and purplish almost yeah with the green flag yeah and something in my mind was like all right you have june bug speed crawls in the bag picks one up put it on a texas rig flipped into the reeds first cast Got my fifth keeper. Never had a bite on it the rest of the tournament, but it didn't matter because I got the fifth one off of it. Mm. And that was just random spur of the moment, like that aha moment of, hey, you have something in that color. Because I packed light yesterday. That honestly is the lightest I've ever packed for a tournament. I, I yeah. left the house expecting not even to have a bite yesterday. I mean, guys, you probably want me to chime in, but I didn't catch shit yesterday, so I don't know what I can add to that. Um I've had seven tournaments on the river uh, college. I got a top 10 out of 300 boats. And then the next year we did a top eight out of a hundred. Then after that, it just literally went downhill to let's see my second to last tournament. I think I caught two and finished dead nuts last. And then this past time I caught zero and I, I got the yips on that place. Now it is in my head. And, and I really want to do cap on what Chris said though, about fishing consistently this is my idea on it it's about how much risk aversion you want to do the first couple of tournaments this year i was i didn't want to risk it and i made a a pact with myself that i was basically going to pick an area and just camp there and figure it out the whole day not gamble if, if it's retries i don't care but spend eight hours there this tournament i halfway through the day started to panic and i said like well let's just make a run up to some old waypoints and that as soon as i did that i was screwed it was done and I gambled. There is a chance if the flats was not blown out, I probably would have had winning weight because all the fish up there are better. However, it was like a 99.9% .9 chance that it was not going to pan out. So I over gambled it. And that's just something I think just to kind of tie in with what Chris said, like how much risk are you willing to take on? So the biggest thing with these club tournaments, you know, because when, when I think of a club tournament, right, I, I think of 20 guys that have full-time jobs and, you know, as much as our lives revolve around fishing, our lives revolve around our full-time jobs more. So we don't necessarily have the time to pre-fish for two, three, four days before these tournaments or at all in, in reality. I mean, if we're lucky, we get a day to go out maybe the week before. Um, and, you know, especially in tidal water and stuff, I'm, if you're at a lake and you have a pattern the week before and the weather is consistent and, you know, everything stays relatively the same, you're probably going to be okay. But like, like Raystown, for instance, we go up there and the week before 
well, two weeks prior, it was beautiful. And then the week before it's like 12 degrees out and it sucks. Yeah. And, you know, if I, if we would have found something the week before when it was nice and went back, it wouldn't have mattered. This fish would have moved, stuff would have changed, but I don't know if you've started to recognize the pattern of how we, or how, you know, me or the guys that I draw more specifically, uh, kind of pattern things like we don't run much most of the time we're like right around the corner from the boat ramp so that's a that's a habit i'm trying to break i mean yeah honestly like if my boat would have ran properly the weekend we had the potomac tournament yeah i would have milk ran a little bit because i had five within 15 minutes i'd have just ran looking for big ones i couldn't get to where i wanted to go just because i mean the boat ran fine that sunday but i didn't trust it enough to take it to where i wanted to go but that's fine i mean i still had what 14.6 yeah, 14.6, and I went, what, like maybe maybe a mile at the farthest and came back. And I think it's also, though, like I was doing what I do best, which is psychoanalyzing myself till 2 in the morning about. Much. That's your problem. You oh, yeah. That. Yeah, you t wait until you see the spreadsheet I made. Um, the Potomac tournament, I didn't have any problem when I wasn't catching anything. And I just knew, like, it's going to come. It's going to turn on. And I would think I was like a pound and some change after I did correct math. Thank you, Kenny, for fixing it. Uh, you know, like b behind you. Yeah. But then flip to the Chesapeake. My mindset wasn't like the bite was going to turn on. It's like, oh, shit, I'm going to bomb here again. Well, I think and uh, it's so important. So, you know, our, our day started similar yesterday. It wasn't like we were setting the world on fire. We fished until 10 o'clock without a bite. And I think. Our boat probably, I, I could say not probably, we we had the most keepers and the most keeper bites out of every other boat out there, yet we ran the least, I'd say, and we just kind of waited them out. We knew that there was fish there. We just didn't know, you know, how to, we didn't know the spot within the spot. We just fished around until we kind of find found it. And then once we started getting, I think the first pass, so we, we fished the same like 500 yard stretch all day. And after the first pass, we both had, I had two bites. He had three. I caught one, he caught one. And then that's when I lost that one on the chatterbait that about, uh, <laughs> it, it made impact with, with my, uh, with my boater. And so that's when we decided, you know, we fished. Forgot about that story. And, a half miles of water, and we, that's the most bites we've had off a single stretch. So let's just keep, Let's make a couple more passes, see if we can milk it for something else. And it's hard on tidal water to make that commitment to a spot when we know that, all right, well, the tide's coming in, so I need to run downriver towards that incoming tide and meet it. And then once it starts coming in more, I'll run upriver and hit my next spot when the tide's coming in. Or vice versa, running downriver when the tide goes out. Um, I, I seriously think that we overanalyze these these tidal fisheries and i'm starting to come to that conclusion especially i don't know if you talked to the guy and uh where we were fishing at for the potomac tournament that was in the kayak that was fishing that kba mm -hmm. did you talk to him at all uh on saturday i did okay uh so he told me that he caught 20 pounds three days in a row back there and yeah he said something about a spinner bait i think it was on friday or saturday he was using a spinner bait so he crushed them friday and saturday on a spinner bait like he yeah almost all his fish on that spinner bait. And then Sunday when the rain started, they turned off of it at like 10 o'clock that morning. Like could not get them to bite a moving bait. So he switched it, uh, he switched to a five inch June bug Senko, and he had HDS live on a big giant Larance unit on his kayak. And he was just live scoping with a wacky rig. And I, I watched him break off one that was probably the biggest fish I've ever seen on the Potomac. And he lost one that was like five right before that. So potentially could have had 20 pounds again with five 20 inch fish and that's stupid, but he, he only fished what, like that stretch might've been a hundred yards, maybe. And it really makes me remember like what Nolan minor was talking about uh, last year when I had him on the show, when he went from, you know, he was a big college tournament angler. He, he paid his dues to go fish the bass opens for a year, did it switched to kayaking. And the biggest thing he said is when he put live scope on his kayak, he really realized how many fish are in an area and that we overthink running and gunning. Well, we, we fish these areas too fast. Like, especially, yes. I would know how many fish that I caught off that spot in three days of fishing in over a two week time period. 
in my boat alone, there was probably close to a hundred fish caught out of that one. What if you fish both banks, 200 yard stretch, they were there in full force. Like maybe I fished too fast. Maybe I didn't pick up the right thing because the first time we went down, we probably had between 18 and 20 pounds. I don't really know. Cause you know, at a certain point in the day, we were catching them so fast and it's not a tournament. We were fun fishing. So we were having so much fun catching them that we just mm-hmm. didn't on to it. But I know definitely I had four or five that were over five or over four. I mean, or close to four. Um, and then we go back and the first thing that Saturday in a team's tournament, I catch, you know, 16 pounds or 15 pounds. I'd say between 14 and 15, like within the first 45 minutes of the tournament. And then go back Sunday and put a limb in the boat in 15 minutes and then run out of there. And then I go back and I talk to the guy in the kayak and he's like, oh, yeah, I just I've never left. He's like, we can share. He said, I know I've seen you in here three days now. He said, don't worry about leaving. He said, we'll just share the spot. He's like, all right, well, that's respectful. That's cool. So there was a reason he didn't leave or need or want to go anywhere else. I mean, he was watching that live. He knew it was there. He knew the quality of it was there. Um, and that was actually the first time, like, I've been adamant that, oh, no, I don't need live on the lower. But after seeing other people catch seven pounders on live on the lower and watching him do what he did all day, uh, finally was like, well, maybe, you know, maybe this could help. And then watching your live scope that day, we were just messing around, like all the fish that were under us that we couldn't get to commit to anything. They were there. Well, and, and this is something I think that's going to be a problem for me with it. How the hell do you tell what's a damn bass and what is anything else in the ocean? So you know, and that's after, where I think it's going to be hard. I've been watching a lot of Josh Jones because he's like the master of live scope and trying to analyze what's what. Um, and it all comes down, I think, Honestly, I think the tail shape of fish on live um, could potentially, because like the the way he knows it's a carp and not a bass, especially down in Texas when the bass are carp size, is the the fork tails is is a giveaway. So he can see that all right, well that fish has a fork tail. Bass don't have a fork tail. That's a carp. Catfish are the same way; their tails are forked. Um. I really, it's hard though. You know what I mean? Hard. It is hard. You got to be so in tune with that thing because you got to think he guides every, almost every day. People are coming to learn live scope from Josh Jones. So he is sitting on that screen and he's had it since the very first one ever before it even had a name. They were just calling it live sonar. And the guy that worked for Garmin, uh, cause I was watching Zaldane's podcast with him on it. Uh, he, he was a cable guy and he went to install a freaking Comcast box for a guy that worked for Garmin. And he was like, Hey, you want to try this new live sonar stuff? And he had never heard of it. And ever since then he's been using it. So he is in tune with that stuff. Cause he's also the one that was talking about, uh, differentiating between male and female crappies by the way they position and set up. So I think it comes that back is so to next lot. level, dude. <laughs> yeah. I think it comes a lot back to know, or a lot about knowing like, uh, how fish operate and like, you know, what their behavioral patterns are. Um, It's a lot of information. I mean, I think that's the one thing the first time I looked at it and I told, uh, I had uh, Matt from SB fishing Hunter on the show last week and a little off air. We talked about it. It's like the biggest thing is there's so much information and you're not always sniping fish. And I think that's a misnomer. Like clearly Matt, you know, he's really good at it, but it's also the other information. Like there's this one area in the back of Pohick. Um, that I found some fish in. Well, I think everyone did, but with the live scope, I realized that there was a shit ton of bait that was small and yeah. there was clouds of it. And every now and then it would disappear. And you know, my co was thinking like, Oh, it just left. And I would shine the scope. It's like, no, it went down, but that made me make the adjustments, go to a smaller crankbait to match it. And then I started to get bit more consistently. They weren't the right size, but it got me a limit real quick. Never sniped a fish, but it just told me the bait was there at Raystown. Yeah. Those submerged trees I I had, I stayed there because I knew there was so much bait in that area, clouds of bait, the bass were going to eventually show up, and they did. So it's just a weird secondhand thing that can help you with that. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because I I had no idea that little bait was there until Sunday when it started raining. Mm -hmm. And I seen it finally, like, the fish weren't really, they were busting on it up on the bank, but I threw a topwater to them, I don't know how many times, I threw a fluke to them. And then I finally seen one that was about this big 
And I look at my five inch fluke and I'm like, all right, they're not eating that. So I put it down. Um, but yeah, so that was just, you know, three days and three trips fishing that spot that I finally saw all the bait that they were eating. But with that being said, there was also big shad in there with us. Yeah. It's just, I don't know. Uh, it's something that I definitely need to finally break down and buy and stop talking about it. The, the problem is, this is my belief. I could be wrong. If you buy it mid season, it's like, if you change your equipment, if you're playing golf or baseball, it's going to mess with your head because it messes with mine. Still, I'm not comfortable with it enough to understand the information in a tournament. And so I'll spend too much time chasing something when I could be wrong. And so I don't know if you would want to do that mid season, if that, that makes sense, like get it, but do you want to get it right yeah. now? Yeah, I do. Um, Cause you, you know, now how simplistic I am when it comes to fishing. <laughs> So even if I do have that and I start out the day and I'm trying to, you know, maybe, you know, cause it, it, at a certain point in the day, I'll realize like, all right, I'm overanalyzing. I'm looking at this stuff for way too long. I'll turn it off and I'll just go on about my day, how I normally would. Uh, there's, I don't know. It takes a certain level of discipline just to like, I could have threw that chatterbait all day yesterday. Cause you know, I love the power fish, but I told Kenny, while we were on the boat, I said, man, I said, these last two tournaments, I don't think I've ever flipped, you know, a uh, creature bait or thrown a Senko so much in the last 10 years. Like you could probably combine the last 10 years of my fishing and the last three trips. I've probably had more time with a slow moving bottom contact bait in my hand than the last 10 years combined. And something in my head before the season started, just, you know, kind of told me I need to go back and revisit the basics, you know, dance with what brought you, I guess. Mm -hmm. I kind of took a step back, started paying more attention to what the people who were fishing around me were doing. And if they're catching fish and I'm not, what are they doing different? Oh, well, they're fishing slower or they're fishing faster. And then not so much adapting my style to that, but it just kind of reaffirmed that, all right, well, you need to go back and, and do the basic stuff again because there's there's beauty in the basics i guess if you want to call it that but it's helped i mean i've picked up a lot more fish this year doing that um and then getting out of my comfort zone throwing stuff that i'm not really used to like i was catching this fish on a sleeper gill down at the lower i never ever would throw that bait i never would throw a swim bait what made you i don't know i <laughs> just <laughs> into it <laughs> I was like, all right, this looks cool. It kind of looks like it's got the color of a yellow perch, but it looks like a bluegill. So they'll be as equally confused as I am. And uh, I'll just throw it and see what happens. And then I finally caught a fish under three pounds on it. Like normally every bite that I had and my friends had prior to that, nothing was smaller than three. So uh, it was a little bit of them kind of getting in my head like, oh, yeah, this works. I, we've been throwing it. And then I finally broke down and bought some. And then I started seeing the size they were catching on it. And I was like, well, I'll give it a try. If it doesn't work, I'll put it down. But it's a bait that I haven't got a lot of bites on. I've just got quality bites on. And I think that's one of the things, too, that I need, especially with tournament fishing, to get out of my head, is I'm not fishing for 100 bites. As fun as it is to go out there and just wail on them all day long and just catch fish after fish, it does not help you in a tournament if they're all the same size. So I got a solid lemon on a chatterbait. The biggest fish I've caught on it all day is three pounds, but I got five three-pounders. What can I do different to get that big bite? Do I need to pick a bigger bait up? Do I need to slow down and throw a drop shot? Or what do I do? Like, that's the thing that I struggle with the most when it comes to tournament fishing is calling it, like, after that limit's in the boat and I'm comfortable. What do I need to pick up to, to get that big bite? And how do I commit to that? Like if it's throwing that freaking giant hunk of plastic that you threw for like seven hours, how do <laughs> I do Don't that? do that. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, if you got a bite, it would have been a, a, a good one. Yeah. But so I've had, I've had two different guys from that past weekend that fish the kayak tournaments. And so there was three major kayak tournaments going out that weekend. And what is hilarious to me in retrospect is listening to them and, and one fish mad a woman and basically said, Hey, listen, this is the best area. I'm going to catch him on a lipless bait. 
Um, and cause I tried to swim jig and it didn't work and nowhere else caught him. And then the other guy, it was like, well, I'm down in a quiet Creek and I couldn't catch him on anything, but a stick worm. And so it's like, but the thing is all of them found the right fish. It yeah. didn't matter what they used. And, and that keeps hitting home to me that you can use the right bait in the wrong area and you're screwed. But if you're in the right area, you might be able to use the wrong bait and still get some bites. You have to find the winning caliber fish, period. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I think on these places that have a lot of fish, though, it's just landing on a populace of them. Mm -hmm. I, if you find a spot that just has a concentration of fish, eventually, if you weed them out, you will finally catch that big one. Um, I really don't know how or why but especially down at the like the tidal water uh, it seems like where there's one there's a hundred it's just a matter of getting them to bite because the one spot that i went to um after i left where we uh me and the guy in the kayak were i know there's big fish there uh because you know i only caught two out of it but i only fished it for two hours but the first one i caught was two seven and then the next one was like a three eight and it was the biggest one i caught that day um, i probably should have just stayed there and milked it more and just fished it more uh cycle through some baits and just see what i can use to get a couple extra bites because i know that spot in particular holds bigger fish i just didn't give it enough time and you know back to what i just said i was like well i was catching them over there let me just run back over there but every fish I caught in that spot was two pounds or less. Mm -hmm. The one I just set and milked the bigger fish and just try to coax them into biting rather than just wanting to catch fish and go back and, you know. What are you going to do? I um, mean, what do you, you know, it is. Well, clearly after last weekend, I don't know shit. Um, oh my uh, God, we have a ton of questions. Good Lord. Sorry, guys. I was not listening to the chat. Uh, been there sleeping. Chris. <laughs> Oh my God, he's got so many questions for him. Absolutely love the show. Chris, what is your favorite color bladed jig bait? Hold jig on. Bait. Let me get my box. Oh my God. Yeah, you had to go down that rabbit hole. You got like uh -oh. three questions for Chris. Uh oh. Uh, guys, again, like keep keep them coming. Uh, I do want to make sure I keep him on a keep him on a short leash here because I know he's busy tonight. But um, uh, yeah, any no, questions? Time. The only thing I gotta do is go throw some weights around here a little bit. Okay, me too. Uh, let's see. All right. So, favorite color bladed jig. So, can I turn the camera around on this? I don't know. He treats me like I'm an IT guy, guys. I don't know shit about technology. So, there's my there's my chatterbait box. If I, I get his pants on, thank God. Yeah, barely. Um, so it depends, right? That's that's kind of a that's a loaded question. Uh, there's, there's ones I have a ton of confidence in, and there's ones that I really, really like that I have zero confidence in, um, the basic, you know, like Ronnie Coleman said, the basic stuff, a little trend, D ball, some test. Uh, so let's see here. All right. That's one of my, let's see. So Tom knows that, and I've spoken on it a million times now about the beauty and the basics and the simplicity and how simple I am. Uh, there's like. 18 different freaking chatterbait colors in here. And I throw three. So anytime that I'm fishing around, you know, fish that are eating perch or bluegills or any kind of forage that tends to be a more green pumpkin sh like shade, the green pumpkin jackhammer. I don't know if you can see this one, but it's yeah, we can see it. destroyed. Um, that's always a good one. I always have it tied on no matter what, because it seems like no matter what, nice. if they want eat anything else, they'll eat green pumpkin. Um, that being said, if I get on shad lakes or places where there's a lot of shad, oh man, I hope I didn't lose that one yesterday. No, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break out the ones that got some character. While he's doing that, guys, a side note, he finally convinced me to buy chatterbaits. I bought one chatterbait and I lost it yesterday. <laughs> good Lord. <laughs> So here's another one. It's awful beat up. Um, all these, all these marks on this chatterbait are teeth marks uh, because it's been fished around nothing but grass. This does not make contact with hardcover once in its life. So every single dent or scratch on this head is from a bass. Um, 
it's a spot remover. That is my absolute go-to anytime there's shad in play or anytime that there's a bait fish that is not a pan fish. The spot remover is probably my number one now um, because I'm starting to fish more lakes that are shad oriented. And I just get bit on it. I catch fish. I catch so many freaking fish on this spot remover. Um, anytime the water's muddy, I have two go-tos for muddy water. And these and these alone. So, like, Tom can attest to this. The water yesterday had, like, an inch of visibility. Mm -hmm. It was disgusting. So, my two go-tos. All white. So, this is a Japanese domestic market only color. It's called Secret White. It is a white chatterbait with a white blade. If you can't find these... Uh, just get some of the do it blade dye or the blade paint, get the white one with the silver blade, dip it all white, hmm. all white, white blade. And of course, black and blue. That's what I threw exclusively yesterday. Um, those are my two favorites. I mean, I freaking love those from muddy water, uh, especially the white one. I don't know. I don't know what it is about white and super dirty water, but it shows up well and they eat it well. Uh, my biggest bag ever on the lower was on that all white chatterbait. And uh, I had 18.4, and it was every single fish was on that all white. But wow. those are those are my three. If I didn't have, if I couldn't buy any other colors but those, that's that's all I would buy. Because I got B High Delight. I have Fire or Brett's Hot Crawl. I have, um, good Lord, what else I got? Um, I got Brett's Perfect Bluegill. I got another JDM color called uh, Cold Shad, which is like a gray, pink, and white. I can make those same colors just by changing my trailer color. I don't need to have a Beehive Delight when I can get a pack of Green Pumpkin and Chartreuse Zacos and turn a Green Pumpkin Chatterbait into a Beehive Delight that way. Hmm. That's really smart. Uh, same way with, like, you know, all the, the basic colors, right? Like... Everybody loves black and blue on tidal water, but everybody loves black, blue, and purple more. So if you take that, uh, I think it's called black light, zoom Z crawl. It's the uh, black with the purple flake. If you take that and put it on the back of a black and blue chatter bay, then you got black, blue, and purple. Um, now, my favorite colors that I don't throw a lot just because I don't have to, but I have a June bug one that's awesome. Oh, that's and, really sexy. Yeah, so... It's it's another JDM only color. I freaking basically sell my soul to get these things, but uh, it's a good one. I like it, but I don't like it as much as the basic stuff. Honestly, I don't think I've ever caught a fish on it. It just kind of lives in this box. It, it caught the fisherman, not the fish. <laughs> so, Joshua, you had a great question. Uh, you got to add more to that. When you say favorite place to fish. What do you mean? Do you mean like on the Potomac or just in general? Give me some more information. I do have another question for Chris. Oh boy. Where did it go? Uh, Lord. Uh, Matt York, Chris, what type of boat do you have? So for the last three years, I fished out of an 18 foot 1998 Fisher Marshawk with a 75 horsepower Mercury two stroke. Recently, I have upgraded to a 2017 Nitro Z18. And I'm not going to lie. I miss the little boat. I miss it a lot. I had so much fun in that little boat. And, you know, if you're a guy that has like a 16 or 18 foot tracker, do not get discouraged about, the, you know, it's not the size of the boat. It's the motion of the ocean, right? So that little boat has been on everywhere. So, so Kurt had it before me and I bought it from him. He had that thing everywhere from the St. John's, to Lake Kiwi, Lake Hartwell, you name it. It's been on big water. I fished out of it on the Potomac for years, the upper, the lower. I had that boat all over the place. Kurt had it all over the place. Um, it limited me to some, like, you know, obviously I can't run to Aquia all the way back up to uh, Piscataway and back. So I think that's kind of, having that little boat is kind of what fine-tuned in, or fine-tuned me to that, all right, well, I got to pick one spot and I got to stick to it because I didn't have the capability of running all over the place, which helped a lot because I would pick a high percentage spot, land no fish and just have to stay there all day because I couldn't run. Mm -hmm. um, now with the capability of having a 150 horsepower and an 18 foot boat with a 96 inch beam width, like I'm good. I can go wherever I want. I just can't let that play into, all right, well, I just caught a bunch of fish. I need to go 28 miles down the river. 
to try to find a big one. So it's going to, it's going to be, a, it's a blessing and a curse. Like I'm eternally thankful for having this boat. Um, it's, it's awesome. I love it. I just mainly needed more space and, and more width. That's the only reason I got rid of the old one because the beam width one, it was only like 60 inches and it was hard think, to run the Potomac. I think there's going to be good things to come. I think it was time. Oh yeah. yeah definitely it's time. It's going to help you out a lot. Um, David Williams, what's his go-to trailer for those chatterbites? All right. So, uh, zoom speed cross, zoom Z cross. Anytime I'm around bluegill, I like to add mass to that chatterbait, and I like a crawl trailer for that. So uh, the speed crawls are good. Um, they don't have you, – you think because they got those big flapping claws, right, that they would have a ton of action, but because of the way that blade distorts the water when you're fishing a chatterbait, it's, it's super subtle, same way with the Z-crawl. Um, I like the Z crawl better for bluegill imitations because it's water. It displaces more water, uh, and it gives that tr uh, chatterbait trailer bulk. Anytime I'm fishing around shad or you know larger bait fish that are a little skinnier in profile, uh, the Yamamoto Zeko is awesome. I got a ton of those. I like them. I also like the Z Man Diesel minnows, uh, the Razor shads, uh, the Beast Coast Blade minnows are becoming my favorite because they're cheaper and they're better. Um, so everybody knows Gary Yamamoto likes to freaking make baits that last like a half a fish. So I switched to these recently if I can find them. There they are. Uh, actually, if you guys are local, Jake's Bait and Tackle has Beast Coast now. So after begging Jenny for like four years, she got them. So the hey. white minnow is basically a Zayco, just way more durable and it has better colors, like way better colors. So like I was talking about taking that green pumpkin chatterbait and making it a bunch of different things, right? So that Brett's uh, Brett's Perfect Bluegill has purple in it. It's got some orange in it. Uh, I can just take this in the green pumpkin purple and this, I think it's called a Blade Runner. Yeah, Blade Runner. It's the same Zayco profile. It's just way better. And the cool thing about these, uh, they, they have a split tail. So everybody's going nuts over these hog farmer baits right now. If you buy these, you just cut the bottom tail off and you have that single tail just like the uh, the hog farmer bait does. So I can do a ton of different stuff with this. I, I like baits that are versatile just so I can get bang for my buck. So it has the same action as the Zayco with the twin tail. But if I cut one off, then I have the same action as the hog farmer. And this one's green pumpkin purple. I have it in white, black and blue, uh, straight green pumpkin. Uh, green pumpkin with a chartreuse belly. I can mix and match and spend $4.99 on a pack of five of these instead of spending $8.99 on a pack of five Zaycos. Guys, that's good stuff. You're not going to be able to get that anywhere else. Um, let's see. Justin Rush. Spunk Shad are amazing on a, on the back of a jackhammer as well. Yeah, so I would, I would assume so. I need to get better at it. Matt York again. Jackhammer or Swim Jig? Uh, confidence wise, jackhammer. Um, this will be fun because, uh, I'm a swim jig guy. That's my number one bait. If I had to get stranded on, on a desert planet, it would be a swim jig. You caught a lot of fish on it yesterday, huh? Oh uh, yeah. It was, it was a banger yesterday. I couldn't catch shit with a hand grenade yesterday. It was bad. Um, I, I think the swim jig is way more versatile because looking at like what a John Cox will do with it, you can pitch it under a dock, you can bounce it on the bottom, depending on how you match the trailer, you can do two or three things with the same bait. Um, and it's a little bit more finessey though. You, you can't, I'm saying like, if you had to put a gun to your head, oh boy. Right here. This box never stays at home. This is, this is like a mortgage payment right here. I, I, I it literally this. is this, yeah, <laughs> what I use. Like, I have a ton of swim jigs, but I'm home without the jackhammers. It doesn't matter where I go. I've caught fish on the upper Potomac line. I've caught them at the lower Potomac. Tidal water, smallmouth water, mouth, you name it, I've caught them on freaking jackhammer. And I mean, that being said, I have a freaking swim jig box here that is gross because there's so many of them and none of them get used. Like, there's a ton of jigs in this box. But what this box lacks or lacks with me is confidence. So yeah. they'll live in this box and they'll probably freaking rust before they catch a fish because 
I just I need to take the time to sit down and do it. But I do agree with you. Uh, swim jig is more versatile. I can't throw. Like yesterday, I got fed up losing jackhammers. I think I lost three in about pukes, so I stopped throwing them. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, it hurt bad. So I tied a swim jig on, and I threw it. Now, granted, it was at the end of the day, and it was kind of garbage cleanup time, so I didn't catch anything on it. But I have enough confidence to say that the swim jig is more versatile, but I just catch more fish on a jackhammer. I don't know if it's a time of year thing or if it's just – me beating to beating the fish to death with it like they have to eat it because they've seen it like 85 times come past the same stump but that's just i don't know anytime but, fish around wood though it's such a great philosophical question though because it's like if you fish a bait long enough if you catch a fish you're gonna be like my decision was correct yeah so you know what i mean so it's like i it's, i don't know to each their own it's good to have both tied on like uh the last couple tournaments i've had I broke down and bought some of those evergreen grass rippers and not many because they're nine dollars. But I, I bought the ones that matched my favorite chatterbaits. So I have spot remover, black and blue, green pumpkin, and uh what else did I say? And a white one. So I I buy those in confidence colors. That way if I'm catching them good on a chatterbait and they stop eating it, maybe I can follow up with a swim jig and catch more fish out of the same area because it is more subtle. But because they're made identical to a jackhammer, I can still use the same trailers on those. So I can still throw my speed crawl, my Z crawl, my, you know, the swimming Zakos. And I essentially have the same thing just without a blade, which is nice. Uh, Justin Rush, braid fluoro on the swim jig. Um, I guess we could both go. So you go you, first. All right. oh, you want me to go first? I'll go first. If I go first. Uh, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> um i am i'm a fanatic with swim jigs i i have a philosophy on how i think they work the best specifically when you're targeting bluegill eaters because depending on the trailer you put behind it you can make it look like a gizzard shad thread fin or a bluegill so i've been on a bite where they wanted a big swim bait on the back of it and that would be a different setup and then other times you just want like a, a rage speed crawl on the back to make a bluegill it just depends on how compact you want to make it i don't want my swim jigs generally speaking to ram through cover like a chatterbait would because if it's supposed to imitate a bluegill and you watch a bluegill at any farm pond guys they pause they stop they float they're not afraid of bass like a shad would be and so i want that swim jig to be just light enough that it'll very lightly tick the cover and when i pop it it'll almost hover and pause <laughs> Because I like to think that the bass shark the swim jig. And when you hit cover with it and you gently pop off of it, it'll plume and stop almost like a spinnerbait will when you jerk it. And then that fish runs right into it and inhales it. If you get like a half ounce swim jig that's a bluegill imitator and you pop it free, it's going to drop like a rock. I think that works great on a shad imitation thing. I just don't think that's exactly how a bluegill acts in a grass bed. So with that said, I, you want to make sure that you have the sensitivity enough to, as soon as you feel a cover, you can just give it a light little tap. And so fluorocarbon I will use, but I have an extremely sensitive rod. If you do not have an extremely sensitive rod, go to braid. That's what she said. Yeah. <laughs> now your turn. Uh, so it depends on the swim jig. I'll go anywhere from 12 to 17 pound fluorocarbon. Um, if I'm throwing like the Beast Coast Working Man swim jig, it's a little light wire hook or the Dave swim jig that everybody loves. Because it is so light wire, I'll throw it on 12 pound fluoro. Uh, if I go to anything bigger, like the jigs that I used to make that have a little bit heavier hook, it's still not a heavy gauge, but it's like a medium gauge hook. I'll throw them on 15. And then if I'm throwing like the grass rippers or anything like that, I throw them on that, uh, that 18 pound Daiwa Samurai Hidden Concepts. And I, I like it on that. Um, I've thrown them on braid, and I don't mind them on braid, especially if I'm fishing around super heavy cover. Uh, the Alabama shake technique is starting to become more and more popular. So where you throw that swim jig with that big bulky trailer on braid, and you just shake the rod tip to imitate a bluegill because it just kind of hovers. Um, I haven't really started into that rabbit hole yet, but uh, like a big pool, I used to catch them on a swim jig up there pretty good. And it was that technique. I just didn't know that that's what I was doing. So that's a great thing that I want to hit on what you just said there. Braid guys transmit signal way better. And, and so 
regardless of the strength and being able to cut vegetation, it's way more sensitive. And so it takes less effort on your part to apply action to it and vice versa, which is probably why it works so well for the Amabama shake technique. Yeah. So like up there, you know, it's nothing but wood. There's no grass in that lake. So I would throw it across a bunch of lay down and I would just keep it riding high in the water column and just shake, shake the rod. It also allowed me to have a better hookup ratio because like you just said, with the, with the fish that shark it and just take off with it or run straight towards you, it took way less effort mm -hmm. to get that hook set because it was so immediate because there's no stretch. So when they hit it, all I had to do was basically just lift because the rod tip was already high and they were just hooked up. So it was, it was nice for that. I just like the invisibility of fluorocarbon, especially because it seems like everybody and their uncle Ricky is fishing nowadays. So, yeah, I, I mean, you want a hot take. I, I don't know for moving techniques, how important that is. I, I think if you're on like a Lake Murray, that has a hundred feet visibility. Yeah. But on the Potomac, on the chocolate milk we're on, if you're fishing a moving bait, I don't think the braid matters at all. I but just think of, of how well, dark green braid silhouettes in the water. And it's it's more of a confidence thing for me because I've done it on Flora for so long that it hasn't really, I haven't needed to go to braid. Mm. And, and, and that's good to know because like guys, I mean, you know, like on this channel, like I crank bait with braid in certain circumstances. I go straight braid just because I won't, I will feel every damn rock with it. And so I won't, I won't pull too hard. And then when I cast those small crank baits, 200 feet i can actually put the hook in them pretty hard from that that distance um but again that 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 to me is just so freaking interesting i want to get through a couple more questions here to make sure i don't waste chris time we got kurt curtis cole Ooh, hey kurt cole. curtis cole with that face and then told you yesterday keep it simple kurt i need to get you on this on the show at some point dude we got some stories to tell he ain't doing nothing right now. Go ahead and call him up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I gotta get oh my guys. Thank you so much for all these are so many questions. Uh here we go. Larry, I don't even know how the hell to say that. So Larry, let's we'll call you Larry. Larry, where do you guys fish? The Chesapeake Bay is salt water. You know what? That was okay. Hold on, let me get a map up. That's a damn good point to people that don't know what the hell we're talking about. Yeah, because up until like two years ago, I had the same question. I was like, there's bass in the Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> here we go. All right. So, Larry, that's a fantastic question for the guys that don't know. So, basically, when you guys think of the Chesapeake Bay, you know, you think of this big honking thing. But if you go up to the headwaters of the Chesapeake right here, you have the Susquehanna River that dumps in. You have the Northeast River. You have the Elk River. All these come in. And actually, there's a canal here. So, if you would like to, you could go to the Delaware River. So this is called the flats. That's its code name. Picture it basically like I call, I call it like the East coast Okeechobee. It's a bowl. That's about three to four feet deep with all vegetation. And then you have channels that go around the outside and you have this one that cuts through. Now, all of these estuaries down here, all the way to Baltimore, allegedly I'll say do have bass in it uh, over the past 10 years. That's hearsay. Yeah, it's hearsay. Uh, we launched, so if you think the best water is way up here, we launched down near Baltimore near this place called Dundee down here. Um, and so, again, allegedly, all these creeks do have some bass in it, but the majority of the quality does come from the upper portion of the river. This, to me, is like the Sabine River. If you guys watch the Bassmasters, it feels like a lot like that, where it's just there's six fish in every creek, and you're making multiple casts habitually to the same areas, hopefully to get those six fish. Because the way Chris described it too uh, yesterday and then today during the live stream, where it's like there was just a stretch and all of a sudden all hell broke loose. And that reminds me a lot of like Greg Hackney when he won on the Sabine and he was way the back in this canal. And there was just one little area back there that worked and he had to just throw his buzz bait to the same sticks again and again and again. Um, some people enjoy it. It's just, it's, an, it's not fun, I guess. You can do it. It's just not fun fishing, if that makes sense. It's a grind. It's a nonstop, constant grind. Uh, but I, I kind of look at that place like a bigger, lower Potomac. Because obviously, like, if you run down past the choir and the beach and all that stuff, uh, the, you, you have more salinity in the water. And it seems like there's a lower bass population. 
Mm -hmm. to whereas you run up towards Fort Washington to where it's actually the Potomac, not so much the brackish, but you're, you're starting to get more freshwater influence. That seems to be where the higher percentage of fish are. Um, and I'm, I'm sure the bay is just like that. It, it almost has to be. So if you're on the flats or if you're up by Hava de Grace or anything like that, where all that fresh water is coming in, the fishing's going to be better. Because there's actually, believe it or not, there's smallmouth bass in the Chesapeake Bay. Like They get weighed in down there all the time. The guy that won it, won it on smallmouth last last week on the VFL. Insane. Twenty pounds of smallmouth. Won the Chesapeake Bay. Yeah, it's just it's stupid. And, and so basically, where we launched from, guys, I think the majority of people in the club stayed local, which is the the upper middle portion of the bay. There was only one person that was dumb enough to run all the way up. Let oh, me just, I wonder who that was. Yeah, I know, right? Thirty eight um, miles one way. Oh, it was bad. Oh, and my poor co-angler was seeing Jesus when we were making that run. Uh, it was it, it, it wasn't that hairy for me because I've done it a couple of times, but I kept like, "Are you okay, dude?" Like, you know, we were pounding because my boat is is not soft. <laughs> it it does not ride clean at all. Oh, uh, let's get these questions. Uh, let's get. Oh, here we go. Last one, Jeremy Sur Suriti Surati, whatever right. you spell your last name. Yeah, I can't read. Uh, when are you going to fish the BFLs? Who do you mean? Next year. Well, there you go. He's going to fish next year. Uh, I'm not, I'm trying to go more grassroots to begin with and kind of earn it. I fished a ton in high school and college, and then I took a lot of time off between 2018 and now. So if I, once I dominate local club, then I'll make the move up, but I want to make sure I, I refine my skills. Again. <laughs> yeah. There fix something <laughs> yeah i gotta fix a lot of things real quick um let's see okay more i think that's everything i think we're good there because then i can get into my next segment and then we can make sure yeah if you guys have any more questions for chris also check him out on facebook he has a social media page he's going pro next year uh white chatterbait killed it for me during the potomac teams tournament came in third absolutely sweet i think that's all oh i actually did have this one question on instagram i probably should get that one up Hold on. yeah it's, uh, i have an instagram page too not just a facebook instagram oh yeah page. it's actually a fishing page so he's he's hip actually yeah yeah why don't you uh why don't you pimp that out real quick while Man, I, I don't even know the freaking ad to that <laughs> i don't know what it is i think it's chris arvin underscore fishing or something i don't know dude how do you not know your own page bro I'm the worst social media person in the history of social media when it comes to marketing myself. I don't know if you've seen the page. Uh, I take horrible pictures. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Justin took my money at the teams with that white chatterbait. So, thanks. Uh, Larry, where is it? No, that's Marty. I'm sorry. I can't read. Uh, Marty on Instagram. Fishing uh, for springtime, do you prefer fishing a wacky or a Nico rig for spring bass? Oh, good question. All right. So it depends on what phase of the spring. I think the Nico rig, anytime they're around, you know, you're around bedded fish, something about that stand up style presentation of that Nico rig draws their attention more and it looks like something trying to actively feed on their eggs. Whereas that wacky rig, I think, excels later in the spring towards post-spawn when they're kind of lethargic and they're trying to recover from the spawn. Um, I would pre-spawn all the way to the spawn, throw a Nico rig over a wacky rig any day. And then after that, I would switch back to the wacky rig. Um, I don't throw a wacky rig a whole lot. Any, anything I do worm-wise is either Nico rigged or Texas rigged. Or i tell you what else I do, and it's sneaky. I don't, uh, I'll take that nail weight, like a 64th or a 32nd nail weight, and I'll put it in the tail of the trick worm or whatever other mm -hmm. straight tail worm I'm throwing because it'll give that back slide action. So if I skip it underneath a bush, it'll still slide farther back to that cover. That's really cool. This is how I break it down. And, and my guys, just go down this rabbit hole with me because nothing is simple. Is it more important in this instance for the fall or the moving on the bottom? The Nico rig really shines as a bottom bait with a different action than the shaky head. The wacky worm shines because of the fall, period, end of story. That's why so many people, when they live scope suspended fish, they will throw a wacky rig versus anything else because of that shimmy that it'll do on the way down. So I think if you're target specific, like you're just flipping some docks or a tree, that's where that wacky worm might be effective on that, that first initial fall. 
But if you're trying to work it through a bed, like Chris was saying, or something like that, like a shaky head would, that is, I think, where it kind of would be supplemented. I think that's why a jig, like for the longest time, so many terms were being won on jigs, and now shaky head took over. So the shaky head supplemented the jig. And I think a lot of ways now, the finesse version of the shaky head is now the Nico rig. So that's how that all, that's it, the information dump, I think. And then it'll all be replaced by this weird hentai bait from Japan, like where it has tentacles everywhere. That's probably going to be the next cool thing. Gross. That it, it works though. It's so stupid. I caught so many in practice. I mean, it didn't help me in the tournament, but I caught some in practice with it. I've never heard a more accurate description of that bait. <laughs> it's they missed a huge marketing opportunity to be able to call it the hentai thing, dude. Uh, it's it's not over yet. Give it time. <laughs> I don't know if uh, if you're familiar with Black Maria baits from Japan. Mm -mm. Yeah, Google that and then report back. <laughs> I will, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, yeah, I'll do that. It's uh, I'll it's basically that. 2006 reaction innovation packaging all over again. Oh my god. Yeah. Hey, sex sells. Uh, let's see, Big DTV, dude. I love your YouTube name. Um, what? <laughs> what? What should? What should we? What should we be fishing for post spawn? In in your opinion? Um, like bait wise or I'm area wise. A... Yeah, what should we be fishing for post spawn? I'm let's go with baits. Let's go with baits. Okay, so I like bigger baits post spawn. And a and a nine millimeter. Yeah, I, I got dirty at work today. I just need to make sure it's not filled with <laughs> Um that's nah, okay. I I'm, I'm actually using my rifle to hold the phone up because it's charging right now. <laughs> it's tucked in between the optic and the in the upper receiver. <laughs> my god. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't have a phone stand. Sorry. I love it. No, no. <laughs> this is on brand for you. Um, jeez. So I'm gonna bait wise. I, that's when I start throwing six inch mag drafts and bigger ribbon tail worms and stuff with more action because they're actively feeding post spawn and they're looking for that bigger meal to try to recoup from the spawn. So that's when I will switch from my four and five inch sinkos up to six inch. Um, I'll start throwing the the magnum speed worms instead of the regular speed worms. Um. You know, bigger profile chatter baits compared to the smaller, more finesse style jackhammers uh, or finesse trailers on the jackhammers. Uh, everything just gets upsized like immediate post spawn because I know those fish want a larger meal to try to recover faster from the spawn because they just lock down on a bed for a week or two and now they're hungry and they want to. Well, plus they just gave birth basically. So they're, they're trying to replenish. And, and also, let's just say that this is for largemouth and a largemouth kind of place. You have the shad spawn, generally speaking, and so that will be tied into the post spawn a lot of times. And so when you get full into that post spawn deal, you're going to have a good shad spawn bite early in the morning. Now, smallmouth wise, let's say you're doing smallmouth on the river, um, that really doesn't change from anything else. Uh, throw your jerk baits, throw your topwater bites are going to start to be really becoming a thing. Um, I would also say go with a Ned rig, a, a power Ned rig will start playing here where you get something a little bit heavier that will actually sit on the bottom in those areas. I like a, I like the ball and jig is what I use. It's a Japanese finesse jig, jig head. And then you put um, a Ned rig on it and it's heavy enough that it won't move in the current. So when you drop it in an eddy with those small mouth that are post spawn, it's not just going to be blowing right past them. It'll sit there for a minute before you move it. So just work those eddies a little bit more thorough in the post spawn. Yeah. Um, that's where I think if you're if you're fishing a Ned rig post spawn, that big TRD comes into play or a holistic over the regular size TRD. Uh, I just I upsize everything post spawn. And then once dead summer hits, then I start having a mix of both of something finesse and then something upsized because it seems like when June, July, August, September rolls around and it's just balls hot out, it, you don't know what they want. Like some fish are looking for bigger forage, some fish are, you know, and then you have that shad spawn and all of a sudden we have fry everywhere. So once the fry get to a certain size and you got to try to mimic those, so then you can scale way down or I don't know, any time in the summer post spawn, it's, it's a mystery. It, it really is. It really is. Um, guys, yeah, we're at the hour mark and I don't want these to be like 10 hour long things. So I will hold my next segment for next Monday's live stream uh, when I go through all the data points, cause I don't want to, don't want to be too long here. 
because you guys have just dumped so many questions on me, which is awesome. Keep that up. That's this is insane. We had almost 50 people viewing at one point. So that is that is really, really awesome. Let me get the last two questions. Do, 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 do. I think we got everything. I just we got another one from Larry, which is uh, what would what advice would you give to any new guests you would have on the show? Oh, shit. Um, it's it's like being on a radio show. A lot of this stuff is repeating. So if I have guests that are on a lot, they'd be like, we already talked about this. It's like, yeah, but you're going to have new people that are listening. Yeah. So don't be afraid to talk about it again. Uh, or we'll talk before the show starts and people will be like, Hey, well, you know, we just talked about that beforehand. It's like, yeah, but no one knows that, you know, we talked about that beforehand to prep. And that's just like a little, a little pet peeve is like always treat it like it's the audience's first time hearing it. Um, because it might be and then refer back to the old stuff. But yeah, it, that's just part of the, the game is understanding that there's a lot of repetitive stuff. Um, David Williams, when will you let's see? When will we see some of your tournament footage? I didn't catch shit yesterday, so oh, there's nothing to see. It though. You got eight hours of nothing. <laughs> you want to see the most boring thing for eight hours? Yes, play this show the people. Ass. Yeah, what are they, they gonna watch? Your casting ability? Oh, well, and Kurt, <laughs> oh, speaking of casting ability, he yeeted the GoPro into the water, which is hilarious. Um, he backlashed that thing, and oh my god, it was beautiful. It was an explosion. Failure. You put it right in his way. <laughs> I did put it right in his way. I don't know where to put a GoPro with a co angler. Or I your really head. don't. I, I probably should put it on my head. <laughs> um, I'm going to try the next tournament. I'm going to do that because, uh, like, the last guy. Okay, this will be the last question, and then any other questions, I'll do a a question roundup. Are you going to fish the teams? That kind of tears it. Yeah, I'll I be write... there. Uh, or, yeah, I'll fish the teams whenever the next one is. I think it's the end of May. We're in May now. Yeah, twenty second. I'll be there. I think it's uh, the end of May. Silver Colorado, white and silver nitro. If you find me in the parking lot, come say what's up. Uh, yeah, I'll be there. I'm fishing the rest of them. So there's five left. Kurt, I got it out. <laughs> <laughs> you did get it out. Oh my gosh. Oh, uh, you did get it out. Um that just blew my brain. Um, I'm gonna be fishing. I'm trying to balance this out. I'm trying to do three videos per week, which basically means I'm sitting in a chair staring at a screen. There's gonna be more tournament footage when I start fishing more tournaments. Um let me borrow I'm your also, GoPro. I got to wear the GoPro. I'm no, let me, also... Let me borrow the boat that actually brings fish back. I thought you had a GoPro. Oh, man. I'm poor. I'll get you a GoPro. We'll figure this out. We'll, we'll Thanks, get you a GoPro so we, have, yeah, so we have some kind of footage. <laughs> um, and this is my last year riding horses competitively, doing barrel racing with my wife. So after that, next year, I'm actually going to go hard in the paint with tournaments for kayaking and bass boats. So next year is going to be my big year of tournament fishing again. Don't worry, there will be more content. Um, again, guys, thank you so much. Uh, we'll do a wrap-up show. Huge shout-out to Chris for coming on uh, this Monday light. I didn't give zero Fs. What, Kurt? What? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't zero. Damn, dude! <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, on that no bombshell, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. You're Bye. listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens, and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.